So this ridiculous assertion of the WHO, the NIH, the CDC, the NICE to do nothing, to do nothing is an abomination. I think it's an abomination because there are, there are very effective methods that people can do at home to treat themselves, prevent the disease progressing. And that's important because firstly, they don't spread it to other people. Secondly, they don't get sick and die. And thirdly, they don't overcrowd the hospitals. So you would imagine this would be an intervention that healthcare authorities would want to promote because this would, you know, decongest hospitals. It would open up hospital beds because you would have less sick people. Professor Anja Baranova, would you comment anything on this particular treatment and uh, what you have seen among your community that you are giving an advice and discussing any medications? Thank you so much, Valentina. I actually would defer to authority of Dr. Marek because he actually works with patients and I'm a systems biologist. I know how those medicines work and I do work with so-called parasite host systems. So virus is a parasite in our system and there are two ways to treat those kind of systems. One is that you are attacking the parasite and another is that you are trying to make yourself less vulnerable to parasite or pay as a due and then go on with your own life after virus stopped uh, reproducing in your cells. So I have a bunch of follow-up questions, Dr. Marek. Dr. Marek, I, of course, I uh, follow the changes in your protocol. I read uh, through a couple of editions, and uh, I, I basically very much uh, in sync with what you are saying. But uh, I uh, would uh, ask a couple of follow-up questions so our uh, listeners would be able to understand some peculiarities in those protocols. For example, from the very beginning, and I understand that's a very specific question, but it's very, very interesting to me. You were advocating using of methylprednisolone in comparison to dexamethasone, well, dexamethasone was the most tested drug. So it was in recovery trial. It was a, a well known before as a hospital based solution for severe inflammation. So can you briefly explain to us why methylprednisolone in this case is a preferable one? Okay, that's a very important question that you've asked. So the study in the UK, they used dexamethasone because dexamethasone was more readily available in the, US, in the UK than methylprednisolone. If you speak to any pulmonologist who's been treating interstitial lung disease for the last 30 years, they will tell you that methylprednisolone is the drug of choice for treating uh, inflammatory lung diseases. So there are multiple reasons that methylprednisolone is by far superior. And you ask a very important question because people use the wrong, the wrong drug in the wrong dose for the wrong duration of treatment. And because the you know, recovery study showed that used dexamethasone six milligrams, people believe that that came down from heaven and that is the final word. It's absolutely incorrect. Firstly, the dose of steroid must be titrated according to severity of illness. The same as a diabetic, you wouldn't use the same dose of insulin for every diabetic. It has to be adjusted according to, you know, with diabetes, it's blood glucose. In COVID, it's the severity of lung injury. So this ridiculous notion of using a single low dose, which is a homeopathic dose, is absurd. Secondly, basic pharmacokinetic data, we know that methylprednisolone penetrates far better into the lung than dexamethasone. This is not even a question. So we know from a pharmacologic point of view, it makes more sense. In addition, we have genomic data, specific to SARS-CoV-2, that looked at the genes that were switched on and off by SARS-CoV-2 and steroids. And by far the most important drug is methylprednisolone. Dexamethasone was less effective. So methylprednisolone and dexamethasone act genomically differently by binding to different glucocorticoid receptors. So there's absolutely no question of doubt that methylprednisolone is the drug of choice. Dexamethasone should not be used, should only be used when methylprednisolone is not available. 
But if methylprednisolone is not available, we would suggest to using prednisone or hydrocortisone with dexamethasone being the last choice. Now, you know, any pulmonologist who's treated interstitial or inflammatory lung disease knows this. And it's a complete mystery that the world is completely silent on this issue. There are multiple studies demonstrating the benefit of high dose methylprednisolone. So it's a really good question. And it's a mystery to me why the world has is so blind to such obvious scientific data. Thank you so much, Dr. Marek. Uh, I am uh, really very happy that we can share it uh, with the physicians which would be listening to us. Uh, and I'm sure that it will be not only in the English world, but also in Russia. You know, I'm Russian, so you can figure out by my thick Russian accent, but I actually your fellow Virginian. I live in Virginia, in the Northern Virginia. So I uh, will ask one more follow-up question, which would be concerning Delta. One of the important differences between uh, Russia and United States is an amount of autopsy which are done on the patients with uh, every disease. And uh, in Russia, I know that uh, doing autopsy on uh, patients who died from coronavirus, it's a must. So absolutely, majority only if there are some special exclusions, then patients would not go to autopsy, but otherwise it's always investigated to the cause of death. So from Russia, I've heard the reports, including reports from very esteemed pathologist anatomists and working with COVID-19, including in the largest COVID-19 hospital in Russia, that in case of Delta, we see in the lungs a little bit different uh, picture. So you mentioned the quick consolidation, but uh, on the uh, pathological assessment, they saw a lot of sensitium, which is uh, happening in the lungs. So when uh, the virus is fusing cells pretty much like a respiratory sensitive virus does, and that means that somehow virus able to uh, get from cell to cell through the side motion, except uh, uh, when in the previous version it was coming out of the cells and were available to antibodies, but if it's doing side motions and antibodies cannot really kill the virus. And we do understand what does it mean for acute COVID patients, but I think that there are some important consequences of that for post-COVID and long-term treatment. One of them is fibrosis. That's what I afraid as a systems biologist, because when we have such a huge amount of cells fused, and if immune system like T cells remove this uh, cell, then there will be a gap and gap is quicker to be patched up by fibrosis. So I would like to uh, you know, it's a follow up to hear from you on that and also what patients can do after they uh, discharge from hospitals or just from regular COVID uh, when they recover, what they can do in order to diminish the fibrotic changes in their lungs. So, you know, the, the, it's very interesting you mentioned the syncytium because that is one of the features that was predominant with the previous, was noted with the previous variants. The fact that, that there's a lot of syncytial formation is kind of interesting, and it may partly explain why it spreads so quickly. Unfortunately, autopsy studies or pathological studies in the US are very, are very far and few between. It's truly astonishing. And you know, patients who die suddenly never get, and if COVID or vaccination is suspected, they don't seem to get an autopsy. And I think it's a tragedy because it can, you know, provide us with a lot of information. So, you know, we, we have autopsy data on the previous variants, and it's really important that that data be published so that we can better understand this disease. Because I think the more information we have, um, the better you can treat it. So, to, you know, obviously the, the tragedy with COVID is mo the patients who die, most patients die of lung failure because they get this terrible fibrotic lung disease. So, you know, we have a few patients in our hospital that develop, you know, this long COVID with severe pulmonary fibrosis. They remain on the ventilator and they cannot be weaned because their lungs are destroyed. And this is essentially what happened in New York is that people were intubated, put on a ventilator, at that time, the treatment was don't do anything. If you remember the WHO and the NIH said, symptomatic treatment, don't treat them. 
And these patients landed up on ventilators with severely profoundly fibrotic lungs. So how can you prevent the fibrosis? Well, I think if you treat the inflammation with corticosteroids and methylprednisolone, to a large degree, I think you will prevent the inflammation. The other thing which is interesting is that we discovered that serotonin is released from platelets that are activated by COVID. What I didn't understand until recently is that serotonin actually promotes pulmonary fibrosis. <clears throat> it's one of the factors that promotes pulmonary fibrosis. So what we've been using is a, a drug which blocks the serotonin receptor, ciproheptidine, which blocks the serotonin receptor. And it's interesting, probably the most fibrotic, fibrogenic drug is bleomycin. People know that bleomycin is a cancer drug which causes pulmonary fibrosis. It's really interesting in an experiment done many years ago, it's been shown that ciproheptidine, which is a serotonin blocker, prevents bleomycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis. So that we think a combination of anti-inflammatory drugs together with uh, ciproheptidine may diminish the risk of developing fibrosis. The problem is once you've developed pulmonary fibrosis, as most pulmonologists know, it's very difficult to reverse. So we know we don't have good treatments for interstitial fibrosis or fibrosing alveolitis, which is a fibrotic lung disease. So what you really want to do is prevent the disease happening in the first place. And that means don't get COVID. When you have COVID treated early, and if you go into the pulmonary phase, you want to be treated aggressively. And that includes using methylprednisolone, you know, together with ivermectin, together with ciproheptidine. Um, the other anti-inflammatory drug which um, uh, um, is being used is the sigma-1 agonist fluvoxamine, which, which is anti-inflammatory. So Basically, what happens is you have the infection and then you have this profound inflammation. And you, you know, clinicians need to do whatever they can to dial down the inflammation because it's the inflammation that then leads to fibrosis. And once the lung is fibrosed, you know, you're done. You, the game is lost. So one has to aggressively treat these people to prevent the fibrosis. Those are very good questions and you know, very, very good observations. I have one more follow-up question then. Uh, you know, you mentioned bleomycin and I jumped immediately because I mostly do my work in the aging and anti-aging research and the bleomycin is a well-established model for the aging. So if you take the cells and you put bleomycin in, you have aging phenomena. And in this case, when the lung cells are treated, bleomycin is producing accelerated aging. Do you think that it could be this observation, uh, it could be extended into saying that uh, the COVID is the agent promoting agent and it is basically pushing us forward down the line we don't want to go. And what to do with that? Yeah, so, you know, I think, you know, COVID is a really bad disease. You know, I've been in critical care for 30 years. I've never encountered a disease like this. Um, this is, you know, people think this is the flu. This is nothing like the flu. You know, flu doesn't cause post-flu syndrome. You know, SARS-CoV-2 is a very vicious virus and it causes this profound inflammation. And it seems that many of the variants replicate to much higher concentration. And I think the more virus you have, the more inflammation. So this is a, a very well evolved virus to wreak havoc on the human. What to do? Can we fix it somehow? Can we give something to people which would help just a little bit? 5% back, 10% back, better than to be too far away. So yes, obviously that's why, you know, we think vitamin D is really important because it has important roles on the immune system. Vitamin C is a very potent antioxidant. So it prevents oxidant injury. Melatonin actually is a very potent antioxidant, both on the cell and on the mitochondria. So, you know, those are three very simple things people can do to boost their health. So, you know, I think general, you know, good diet, exercise, and to basically 
do whatever people can do to promote and boost the immune system. And that may also include zinc. Zinc is very important for you know, cell-mediated immunity. Many people, particularly elderly, are zinc deficient. So I think if they took zinc, which is you know, reasonably very cheap, it would help. So I think you know, people need to take ownership of their bodies and ownership of the health and do whatever they can to protect, to improve their immune system and to protect them from this very vicious virus.